Welcome to this lesson on iterative methods for solving linear equations. Uh, let's jump right in um, and just recall that previous methods you've learned, like LU decomposition or PA equals LU decomposition, Cholesky decomposition, these are all direct methods for solving a system of equations. Right? You go straight to the solution by doing something to the matrix. Um, and these tend to be order n cubed methods if we're talking about an n by n matrix. On the other hand, you're familiar with the idea of iterative methods from, uh, for instance, things like the bisection method and Newton's method. Those weren't specifically for linear systems, um, but they were iterative methods. And so you know that an iterative method means that you start with a guess um, and you improve your guess at each step of iteration. Um, and uh, the basic concept is that you might never get to the exact solution, um, but you specify a particular tolerance and you hope that you get within that tolerance in a reasonable number of iterations of the method. And so um, you're going to learn now an iterative method for solving AX equals B. This is called the Jacobi method, and it depends on a really simple observation, which is that you can take a matrix A and just break it up into the sum of two things, something that's um, non-zero only on the diagonal, and then everything else, so it's zero on the diagonal. So D holds the diagonal elements of A, R holds all the non-diagonal elements. And so you can see this example is how we uh, break this up with D and A. And then you can note that the solution, or the equation AX equals B, is the same as D plus RX equals B, and we're going to move this bit over to the right-hand side. So dx equals b minus rx. Um, and therefore, x equals d inverse. Since we've left multiplied, we have x equals d inverse uh, b minus rx. Now, you'll notice that x appears on both sides. Um, and so this, this equation doesn't solve for it explicitly. But what you do is you plug in a guess for x, and you see if you get x out. And you don't. You get something, maybe it's a little closer to x. And then you plug in again, and then you plug in again, and then you plug in again. And this is an example of something that's called fixed point iteration. You just keep repeating, um, hoping that you converge to a place where when you plug in for x on the right, um, you plug into this whole formula and you get out the same thing for x on the left. Um, notice that since d is a diagonal matrix, calculating d inverse is really, really easy. Um, and then I made this statement about you hope you converge to the solution, and we'll say, we'll say a little bit more about convergence in a bit. If you want, there are a couple of examples here on this slide, and I won't do all the algebra of this fixed point iteration uh, by hand, but I uh, strongly suggest that it's worth working out some of the details to see how it goes. And, uh, you can then try it again, changing from this original value of b that I've given you to this value down here. So I'll provide you with some code for doing this Jacobi iteration. Um, and there are some computational things to keep in mind. d, again, is the diagonal elements of a. Um, so r is everything else. The way we calculate this Jacobi iteration in r is by doing b minus and then this is matrix multiplication. You might remember this operator. So this is multiplying the matrix R by the vector X. And then we're going to divide by D, where D is just a vector of the diagonal elements. Vector of the diagonal elements of A. So we actually never create the matrix D. We just kind of divide two vectors element-wise in this uh, statement here. And... Uh, it's not too hard to convince yourself that every iteration is order n squared. Um, it could be even faster if R turns out to be a sparse matrix, but at worst, it's order n squared. And you'll notice that that's way faster than order n cubed uh, for direct methods like LU decomposition. So what you lose in sort of directness, um, you gain in speed for this algorithm. Uh, so... If you have an iterative method, you know that you have to decide when it stops. Um, the iteration is not guaranteed to converge, so you always should use a maximum number of iterations. And even when it is converging, you need a stopping criterion. Um, and the usual stopping criterion is the relative residual norm or the relative backward error, where you just have your current guess x, 
and you compute the residual between the b vector and a times your x, and then you divide by the norm of b to make it a relative value. And you insist that that relative residual norm is less than some tolerance that you yourself are allowed to specify. So it's worth asking, when does this converge to the solution? And uh, if it converges, how fast? So we'll just do a little bit of algebra here. Jacobi iteration says x equals d inverse times b minus rx. And we can just expand things. Um, to write this as uh, minus d inverse rx, so that's kind of taking the second term here and expanding, uh, plus d inverse b, so this is the first term over here. Um, and we're going to call this bit, this minus d inverse r, this will be use, useful to talk about on its own, so we're going to call that the, the matrix b. So what the Jacobi iteration really says is uh, your next guess for x is equal to b times your current guess plus this z vector here. Um, and we're going to write the kth guess for the x vector a different way. We're going to write it as the exact value of x, which we don't know what it is, plus whatever the error is at the kth step. And then we still have our plus z term. And if we distribute, we can write this as bx plus z plus b here uh, acting on the kth error. Um, of course, bx plus z, if you look up on the first line, this is just another name for x. So xk plus 1 over here is equal to x plus b times the kth error. Um, and what that tells you is that the k plus first error, okay, um, is just b acting on the kth error, right, since the k plus first error is the difference between x k plus 1 and x. So it's equal to this bit that's left over b times the kth error. And if you were to build that up recursively from 0, you could convince yourself that the k plus first error is thus the 0th error times b to the k plus 1. So what we're going to do is write the initial error e0 as a linear combination of whatever the eigenvectors of this b matrix happen to be. So e k plus 1 um, is equal to b to the k plus 1 acting on um, some linear combination of eigenvectors of b. And of course, since these alphas are scalars, we can bring this b matrix inside. That's what we've done here. Here's the B matrix inside. And since uh, the V are eigenvectors of uh, B, then B k plus 1 acting on V becomes lambda i k plus 1 times V. That's by the definition of an eigenvector. And so um, here's the final answer. And what you need for this error to go to 0 as k gets large is you need these multipliers to be less than 1 in magnitude. If you're multiplying by something bigger than 1 in magnitude, quantity is going to get bigger. So it turns out we've shown that a necessary and sufficient condition for Jacobi to converge is that all the eigenvalues of the B matrix, which to remind you is minus D inverse times R, the eigenvalues of B have to be all less than one in magnitude. Um, there's a, a sufficient condition that's even easier to check uh, for Jacobi method to converge, and that's if the matrix A is strictly diagonally dominant. What strictly diagonally dominant means is that you look at each row of the matrix, and you look at the entry that's on the diagonal, and if it's larger in absolute value than the sums of the absolute values of all the other entries in the row, that's diagonally, strictly diagonally dominant. So that's a, a easy to check and a sufficient condition. Um, now, based on the calculation on the previous slide, when the eigenvalues of V are even smaller, much smaller than 1, convergence is even faster. The closer the eigenvalues are to 0, the faster convergence will be. Um, and also, for this sufficient condition about strict diagonal dominance, the greater the diagonal dominance, in other words, the, the more this is large than this thing, um, then the faster the method will converge. There are other iterative methods we can discuss, and we're going to introduce one called Gauss-Seidel. Um, in order to do that, we're going to take our matrix A, 
And we're actually going to even decompose it one level further. D is still going to have the diagonal elements, but L is going to have the upper triangular stuff. U is going to have the lower triangular stuff. Note this is very different from LU decomposition. That's a multiplicative decomposition. Here we're adding these matrices together, so it's very different. But using that notation, um, then Jacobi iteration is this business here. It's x equals d inverse operating on b minus uxk minus lxk, uh, where we've broken up our R matrix previously into this u and l component. So what Gauss-Seidel is, um, which also goes by the name of Liebman method, it's the exact same except the computation of xi k plus 1 uses the components of xk plus 1 that have already been updated. And it turns out that um, a mathematically equivalent way to write that is instead of taking lx acting on k here, you take lx, uh, l acting on xk plus 1. Um, this turns out to require a little bit less memory uh, than Jacobi, and it can converge faster. Uh, finally, one last method is successive over relaxation, and I think the, the formula is written down here, but I think knowing the intuitive explanation um, is more useful, and the intuitive explanation um, is that at every time step, you take a weighted average. Um, it's something like, you know, omega times the Gauss-Seidel formula, um, and then it's plus 1 minus omega times your current guess, which is xk. And that's what your new guess, xk plus 1, is going to equal. And if you were to plug in everything you know, you'd come up with an expression that looks something like this here. Um, and here I should say that uh, omega uh, for over relaxation, this parameter omega is usually something greater than one. If you choose something less than one, it's called under relaxation. Um, you can find more details about this in the textbook uh, if you're interested. So you might wonder, you know, of these methods, like which one is the best, Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel or successive over relaxation? And of course, there's no answer. Um, the answer is it always depends on the problem. And usually you try to do some numerical experiments to figure out which method is best in your situation. Um, so it's good to have all of these in your pocket. Let's take a step back and just talk about why we would even be using iterative methods. So, as I mentioned, single step of an iterative method typically requires n squared steps. So, it can be faster if you get within an acceptable tolerance in fewer than n iterations. If it takes n iterations, then n times n squared is n cubed, and then you might as well just be doing some kind of LU decomposition or similar. Um, it's also a great idea if you already have a good approximation or an initial guess about the solution x. Right? I mean, there's no reason to start Gaussian eliminating from scratch if you already have a sense of where x should be. If you have a guess, then you can just iterate on that guess. Um, and this is called polishing. Um, and then finally, when the matrix A is sparse, um, which means that um, all but order n, usually, of the entries are equal to zero, uh, you can even get this to be faster than n squared steps per iteration. And so it gets... Um, it gets even faster, whereas something like Gaussian elimination typically fills in a sparse matrix when it does row operations, and you lose that nice sparse structure, and it's just as kind of a wasted efficiency. Um, there's a great example that it's worth taking a peek at. I'm not going to restate the whole example here, but look at example 2.25 uh, in the book. And I did some numerical experiments solving this problem on a laptop for n equals 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and a million, okay? So um, what I've written down for you is the different sizes of the matrices uh, that's that, that you have to store. So like here for the 1,000 case, it's 8 million bytes if you do a dense matrix, 65,000 bytes if you do a sparse matrix, um, and so on. You can see how it goes on up. You can't even do a dense matrix for the last two cases. A uh, computer doesn't have enough memory, so we end up just doing uh, the sparse ones. 
also on this slide is looking at the amount of time necessary to solve the problem using Gaussian elimination versus Jacobi. So for n equals 1,000, Gaussian elimination is like 0.4 seconds, and you're like, wow, that's so fast. Um, if you do it, in fact, with a sparse matrix, it's only 0.003 seconds. That's screaming. Um, and then if you do the Jacobi iteration up to four digits correct in the infinity norm, it's actually longer um, than the sparse matrix Gaussian. Um, it's 0.014 seconds. So, you know, that's not so convincing that using an iterative method is a good thing to do. Let's bump it up to n equals 10,000, so a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. Doing the dense matrix with Gaussian elimination takes uh, 339 seconds. That's over five minutes. Sparse matrix um, using um, the solve command does Gaussian elimination. Uh, in R, that's 0.01 seconds. So sparsity helps you a lot. Um, and Jacobi is still a little bit slower than sparse matrix solve. But now, bump it up to n equals, uh, n equals 100,000. You can't even do the dense matrix solve on the computer. There's not enough memory. If you do the sparse matrix solve, it's 0.1 seconds. And sparse matrix uh, Jacobi iteration is about uh, half a second. So still slower. But now, finally, if you get up to a million, you can't do the dense matrix solve. You can't even do the sparse matrix solve. So you can do Jacobi, and that turns out to only take... Uh, just about six seconds, which is pretty good for a million by million matrix. So this is just trying to give you a sense of how things scale, right? And that what the appropriate method is, um, is just highly contextual and certainly depends strongly on the size of the problem that you're solving. All right. Thanks for listening.